Good afternoon. I don't have anything to like. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, friends. <laughs> oh, yes. So I, I hate to stop all of the um, wonderful conversation, and please do continue to eat, um, but we would like to continue with our lunch program. Um, hello, my name is Latita Smith. I am the president of Moses Taylor Foundation. We are really honored to be a presenting sponsor of Scranton Area Foundation's inaugural NEPA Learning Conference. A couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to visit my daughter's pre-K class uh, during career week. And um, career week, career week, for pre-Kers um, is daunting by any respect, um, but it was particularly challenging for me um, because my daughter's friends have some awesome parents. And I was scheduled for like the fourth day of the week, so all during the week I was hearing about the parents who were coming into her class. So there was one mom who is a, a soldier in the army and she came in in her full uniform. She took the kids through an obstacle course, an obstacle course in the gym and everyone thought she was amazing. There was another dad who was a pharmacist, and he did a whole exercise for the kids around distinguishing the difference, differences between drugs and common household items. So he had a jar, and the kids had to guess if there were Skittles in the jar, or if it was actually drugs in a jar, and another jar, they had to guess whether or not it was cleaning fluid or Mountain Dew, and every kid got like a safe drug badge at the end of the day. So this is how my week is progressing. <laughs> and so my husband and I were strategizing on what I was going to do when it was my turn. So my husband said, well, you know, if the kids were a little bit earlier, maybe you could give them all cash. To which I thought, I don't know what this man thinks that I do for a living. Um, but in the end, what I decided to do was I read a book um, to them. I shared with them a picture book called um, The Lion and the Mouse. And it's an unlikely story about how um, a mouse gets in trouble with a lion and the lion was about to eat him, but in the end, the um, lion let the mouse go, only later on for the lion to find himself in trouble and the mouse helped him out. And so I did this whole lesson about, you know, the importance of helpers and how I have this job um, where I look around the community for people to help. And then I gave them all mouse cookies because I'm not completely above a bribe. <laughs> uh, but my pre-K experience aside, I think that often describing what we do for a living can be really hard. And often when I find myself in a casual situation with someone and they ask, what do I do? I say, I work for a foundation. Usually that suffices for like polite conversation. Um, but every once in a while, someone will ask to, you know, a little bit more or, you know, what does your foundation do? And I usually say, you know, we give grants and we give money to nonprofit organizations like the Boys and Girls Club and Meals on Wheels. People know those organizations that kind of helps them to understand what we do. And then every once in a long, long while, somebody is really actually interested in what that means and what my real job is. And then I get the opportunity to explain that it is my privilege to have the opportunity to work with some of the most dedicated and thoughtful and brilliant people in our community. And together we try to figure out how to tackle some of the most difficult problems that our community faces. And really for me, that's the real answer. That's the reason why I wake up every morning. Um, that's the reason why I feel so blessed and privileged to have the job that I have. And the reason why I'm so excited that all of you are here today. And it's another reason why I'm excited that we have Leslie Crutchfield here today to speak with us. Leslie is an author, an educator, and a social change expert, and executive director of Business for Impact at Georgetown University's McDonough School of Business. Leslie has previously managed, was previously managing director of Ashoka, the global venture fund for social entrepreneurs, and she co-founded and led a national nonprofit social enterprise when she was in her 20s. Leslie has contributed to Fortune, Forbes, The Chronicle of Philanthropy, and Stanford Social Innovation Review. And she has appeared on such programs as ABC, Fox, NPR, and PBS. 
She served as a trustee of the Seed Foundation and volunteered with Crossroads Africa. She holds an MBA and a BA from Harvard, and she teaches corporate social responsibility in Georgetown's MBA program and nonprofit leadership on LinkedIn Learning. You received in your um, bags today a copy of her best-selling first book, Forces for Good, The Six Practices of High-Impact Nonprofits, which she authored with Heather McLeod Grant and was widely regarded as the blueprint for nonprofit excellence. I am super excited that um, the foundation was able to share this book with everyone and make it available because I think that that book is the antidote. If you have any of those kind of pesky board members who who say that nonprofits would be so much better if they run like businesses. I don't have any of those board members, but if you do, then this book is the antidote for them. Because at the very, very beginning of the book, from the start of its introduction, it says, the best businesses cannot tell us how to change the world because that is not their primary purpose. And throughout the book, she offers so much more sound guidance on what we can learn from other nonprofits about what effectiveness really looks like. And her second book, Do More Than Give, The Six Practices of Donors Who Changed the World, which was co-authored by John Kenya and Mark Kramer, this book was recognized as really being a game changer for philanthropy. And in that book, Leslie and her associates helped foundations think about how we could contribute to catalytic philanthropy, philanthropy that is focused, collaborative, and dedicated to learning. And her most recent book, How Change Happens, Why Some Social Movements Succeed While Others Don't, Leslie takes a look beyond individual organizations and donors to movements and giving us examples of what it's taken to shift hearts and shift minds to ultimately shift behavior and shift practice to reduce things like drunk driving, to eliminate polio, or to strengthen gun rights. I think, friends, that in our quest to solve some of the toughest problems battling people in Northeast Pennsylvania, Leslie's research and her insights provide us with roadmaps to help build the organizations and movements that can really make change happen. And she, un she thoughtfully unpacks concepts that have become almost cliche in our field. In Leslie's work, ideas like collaboration are not just about partnering together on a grant proposal, but really thinking about how we share leadership and work in partnership with friendly and sometimes adversarial allies toward a common mission. In her work, advocacy is not just about getting to know your legislators, but about how we build broad-based community buy-in for our work, how we activate people with lived experience on the issues that we care about, and how we translate that into real public policy change. And in her work, leadership is not just about calling the shots from on high, but it's about something I love called transcendent listening and letting go of ego and preoccupation with one's own organization for the sake of a larger vision, leading through influence, not authority. Leslie has studied some of the most influential organizations, donors, and most significant movements of our time to uncover the patterns and the lessons that we can apply to our own work. Friends, please join me in welcoming Leslie Crutchfield. Well, thank you so much. Wow. Latita, what, a, what an amazing introduction. I don't think anybody has to read the book. I, <laughs> I think we're done. Let's have dessert. That, that was um, such a, a heartfelt and insightful uh, summary and introduction into uh, what we're going to talk about today. Um, it really is my pleasure to be here at this first, I hope, annual NEPA Learning Conference at the invitation of the Community Foundation. And I've been really looking forward to having the chance to come and visit with you all and talk today about how we can together change the way we change the world. Um, I'm particularly excited to be in Scranton, uh, mostly because I grew up in Pennsylvania, not too far away in the Philadelphia area, but I never had a chance to come to Scranton until this invitation came my way. Um, although I have to say, driving here from the highway, I felt like I've lived here because um, I have to say I have three kids and two of them are teenagers, so I think we've binge watch The Office um, <laughs> all, nine all nine seasons at least three times. So we, we've got it down. My seven-year-old on the way out here, when I said I was coming to Scranton, said, are you going to see Dwight? <laughs> I 
I don't think so, but I, I hope so. Um, so it, this is truly special on many levels. Um, and I came, uh, actually I live in DC now. I teach at Georgetown, as Latita mentioned, and run a center for business for impact. And we are all about the intersection of people and planet and how do you balance profit with impact on uh, society. And uh, we get to teach, we work with student leaders and uh, corporate partners as well as nonprofit and government partners to co-create solutions to the big complex challenges that we face today. And I, I came to Georgetown on a research fellowship to work on this latest book, How Change Happens, what, that we're gonna talk about. But when Maggie and the folks from uh, the Community Foundation reached out, we said, let's start with forces for good. Uh, this, this study of um, high impact nonprofits. And we're gonna unpack some of the most uh, successful strategies that winning nonprofits use to really have impact on the ground, locally, at the state level, and even nationally. And then we'll move into movements. And we're gonna talk about leadership and how change happens on a, a couple, uh, really three different levels. Um, we're definitely gonna focus on the nonprofit level because you as leaders and staff of nonprofit organizations are called on uh, to uh, obviously um, take on the big challenges of the day. We're also gonna talk about you in the context of the broader movements and causes that you're part of. So even if you run an early learning childhood center or you're part of a, uh, a, health, a community healthcare facility, you're part of the larger movements and conversations that are happening in our time. And we're also gonna just talk about you, you as leaders and what you can do to really embrace these practices to become more effective, both at the office in your nonprofits, across the larger movements that you're part of and, and in your personal growth as workers and leaders. So let's dive in. Let's start with this notion of how you change the world through your nonprofit organization. For the start, we're gonna focus on the four walls of those uh, nonprofits that you're part of. And we're gonna draw from the lessons from Forces for Good, the six practices of high impact nonprofits. Um, now the driving question behind our research for Forces for Good was what makes great nonprofits great? And we started this research uh, back in around 2003 when those of us in the social sector, I've been in the social sector for more than 25 years, we were all buying up copies of Good to Great. I would drive to Borders Books. Remember there was a Borders Books? Um, and was buying copies of Good to Great to give to my grantees. I used to be the managing director of a venture fund called Ashoka in uh, um, uh, outside DC, funding early stage social entrepreneurs in the US and Canada. And I was struggling to find materials to um, train them on how to start and manage and grow high impact organizations. So I was using business books, I was drawing together my business school cases, and the idea struck that we need our own stories, we need our own studies in the social sector, because of course, at the end of the day, what drives you in the nonprofit sector is mission, not necessarily money. Of course, without money, there's no mission, but, but mission comes first, right? So we needed to, to break new ground. And, and so my co-author and I set out on what became a four-year journey to study a whole array of high-impact nonprofits that had gone from zero to great in a matter of decades. So relatively new nonprofits, some of which you've um, definitely heard of, right? We looked at Habitat for Humanity. And Habitat obviously has engaged uh, more than a million volunteers, building hundreds of thousands of homes for vulnerable uh, families and individuals all, all around the world, right? So definitely a household name. Um, we studied um, organizations like Feeding America. I know that you have a food bank here um, in the Scranton area. Any, any, any food banks in the house that are part of Feeding America here today? Um, so this network of more than 250 food banks has moved billions of pounds of food to feed the hungry families that we know exist uh, right here in our communities today. Um, we also studied some less well-known nonprofits, but very high impact. In fact, the way we picked them was we did a survey of almost 3,000 nonprofit leaders to nominate the organizations that we should study for our book. And so here's some organizations that came up in our study, Youth Build USA. So Youth Build has affiliates in um, uh, all over the country, more than 200 affiliates, and they work with 
at-risk young people that are the opportunity youth of tomorrow, you know, they might have dropped out of high school, they're at risk of homelessness, um, drug addiction, teen pregnancy, and Youth Build not only helps them get their GED, but get job experience on building sites and construction sites, so they have something to put on their resume, they have a skill in their, in their tool belt. Um, and moreover, have moved more than $2 billion at the federal level through first HUD and now Department of Labor into low-income communities to support um, these kinds of efforts. Another group that we studied and really learned so much from was self-help, uh, CDFI out of Durham, North Carolina. Now, you might not know self-help, but you might know the Center for Responsible Lending, uh, one of its subsidiaries, which really was the lead role in helping to write the Dodd-Frank Consumer Protection Act, um, Act uh, working on issues around predatory lending, and they have been for decades trying to stem the tide of the practices that led to the global recession 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, and we're still, uh, I know our communities, particularly those that are at risk of um, uh, poverty housing, are still struggling with. So we looked at really well-known organizations, we looked at not so well-known organizations, but very high impact if you talk to the experts in those fields. And then we kind of got a chance to study some surprising organizations. Um, we looked at the Heritage Foundation, the preeminent policy think tank conservative group down in DC where I live. Um, now, if you are not a member of the Heritage Foundation, you might know that it has members. It has almost a million members. Hundreds of thousands of people writing $25 checks because they believe in the philosophical platform of the conservative movement. Heritage Foundation looks and acts more like the Sierra Club than it does the studgy old maybe Urban Institute or Brookings, right? So we learn so much from studying both the right and the left side of the political aisle, and we learn from all different kinds of organizations too. Another interesting <coughs> one in our portfolio was the Exploratorium in uh, California. Anybody been to the Exploratorium in the Bay Area? Okay, a few hands have gone up. Anybody ever been to a science museum or a children's <laughs> museum? Right, of course, we all have. Well, the Exploratorium's mission when it was founded by Frank Oppenheimer was to change the way we experience museums in this country. They make them places where you learn, you interact with exhibitry, right? Not, not just a place to look at stuffy exhibits on a wall and never, never interact, never learn. Making them places of active learning. Now there's more than 600 science and learning museums around the world. Almost all of them were modeled on the one of the Exploratorium even though they don't carry the Exploratorium brand, and we'll talk about how the Exploratorium was able to have such a large-scale change, really with just one site uh, in one location, in this case on the West Coast. So we looked at all these nonprofits, and we, my co-author and I went to all their headquarters, interviewed board members, you know, spent four years mucking around in these organizations trying to figure out what, what's made them so successful. And we looked at some of the traditional things that that you'll read about in nonprofit management textbooks, right? And we looked at their budget size, for instance. And now some of them had huge budgets, Habitat, more than a billion globally if you roll up all their affiliates. Um, but some of the organizations we studied were pretty small. Um, you know, Youth Build USA was operating on around 19, uh, 15 million nationally. For, so for a national organization with uh, countrywide scale, that was, that was relatively modest. Most of the organization's budgets were in the kind of 45 to $50 million range. Um, we studied UNIDOS, uh, which was then called National Council of RASA, um, Teach for America, uh, Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, we looked at, you know, again, their brand names. Some of these groups you've heard of, obviously, but many you haven't, right? And we looked, at, we looked them up on Charity Navigator to see what could that tell us. And we found out that some of the groups we studied got some of the best ratings on Charity Navigator. But some of them got kind of crummy ratings, right? So like these things don't tell us what makes great nonprofits great. So if it's not these things, what is it? What makes great nonprofits great? Well, what we learned from our research is that nonprofits build movements not just their organizations. They are obsessed with advancing causes and moving the needle on the outcomes you seek, not just managing within the four walls of the organization. Now, it's not that you can't, that you don't have to you know, manage your staff and keep the lights on and keep the 
funding coming through the door. But that's, that's necessary to run your, non, your nonprofit. But it's not sufficient to explain greatness. So how do these high impact nonprofits do it? How do they build these movements? Well, we found that they were very adept at the use of leverage. So I have this quote here from the ancient Greek philosopher Archimedes who talks about, give me a lever and a place to stand and I alone can move the world, right? With the, the force of leverage, you can, you can really punch above your weight, right? If you think of a, we use leverage in our everyday life. If I'm trying to, you got a guy who's trying to move a refrigerator, you can't, but with the dolly, you can get that force of leverage and lift something 10 times your weight. We use leverage in the nonprofit sector and we have to, right? Because we know that you guys operate every day on you know, thin budgets, you're scrapping it together. I know we're scrappy here in Scranton, um, uh, particularly. Um, and so you've got to find shortcuts. You've got to find ways to make more, to do more with limited resources. And that's what all great nonprofits do. Because every single one of these groups that we studied was founded in the post-civil rights era. They were founded after 1970 at the local level, and most of them very, very small, and built up to the scale of impact that they've had today. And the way they've been able to do that is because they, again, focus beyond the four walls of their nonprofit, right? They, they look to government. How can we influence policy so we can get statewide or even national scale of impact? They look to the business sector. You know, certainly, how can we get maybe some philanthropy from those corporate foundations? But how do we work with and through businesses to advance our causes? Um, they look to the individuals, the people that you serve, the neighbors in the neighborhoods where you work, the volunteers that show up at your doorstep each day to help out, um, engaging them in these movements. And last but not least, they work with the other NGOs, the other nonprofits, their nonprofit peers, to create a whole that's greater than the sum of the parts. And we'll talk about how they do that. Now, these six practices are the strategies that we found that the high impact nonprofits that we studied employed that other kind of average performing nonprofits didn't, didn't do or maybe didn't do as well. And I want to share some of these practices with you, just a couple that I picked out um, that I think really can inform uh, and resonate with the work that, that you're doing in the communities that you serve. And I want to start with number one, which we call advocate and serve. So great nonprofits refuse to choose between just providing direct services on the one hand or engaging in advocacy on the other. We were really surprised to find that because particularly for most of the groups that we were studying, at least half of them never would have touched advocacy with a 10-foot pole. Um, you know, and, but they, they leaned into this when they realized that their ability to have the kind of impact they wanted to have on the world was getting stymied, right? So let's, let's talk about one classic example, Feeding America, the, the network of the nation's food banks. You know, when Feeding America was founded by a social entrepreneur, the idea was really simple. You know, it was the 80s, like warehouse this food that's, you know, we had those slightly damaged boxes of Kellogg's Corn Flakes. We had those slightly dented cans of peas that were still edible. Warehouse it and get it into the hands of hungry people. And that's what the food banks did for the first two decades, chugging along. And then in the 90s, um, we had welfare reform. The Republicans were leading Congress. We had Clinton in the White House. And there was a lot of changes underfoot from policy perspective. Um, they were going to zero out TFAP, for instance, a food assistance program, $40 million federal program at the time. And at that time, Feeding America was under the leadership of a nun, Sister Christine Vladimir Hoff. They're based in Chicago. And she said, we can't let this law you know, and assistance go away. If, if, if we don't have the support coming at the, the national and state level, then we can't have as much impact on the ground that we want to have in our local community. So came to Capitol Hill, found somebody from the Department of Ag who understood how to lobby and talk to Congress. They set up a shop in Washington, D.C., got smart on how, and then they said, we're going to raise the voices of all of our volunteers. And one of the powerful things about a food bank is that each food bank might be relatively small, but there's one in almost every congressional district. So they're able to put this priority in the front of all of our elected officials. And when it came time to take the vote for that particular welfare program, not only was it protected, but they ended up expanding it. So now 
when we finished our research for Forces for Good, it was a $400 million program. So they got a 10x increase in terms of that kind of support. So that's back to my point about leverage, right? Um, but this wasn't easy. There was a lot of dissension. Food bank, a lot of food bank directors didn't want to get involved with lobbying and advocacy. That's kind of a dirty word. Our mission is to put food on the table for hungry people, right? But if they started to think about it, really, if we don't advocate, if we don't raise our voices and build on the power of the grassroots level, then we're not going to have as much impact as we could. And this works on the local level too. Obviously, Feeding America now is a big national group, but when we did our updated edition of Forces for Good, which came out a few years ago, we looked at local groups like um, RIASAP, it's a local alliance for um, uh, juvenile justice up in Connecticut, not, not too far from here. And they you know, wanted to reduce recidivism into the Connecticut juvenile justice system, which Connecticut's got a pretty small population, but they had so many prisoners in Connecticut 10 years ago, they were shipping 5,000 a year to Virginia to incarcerate them. And they had a really dysfunctional system. And, and RIASAP saw an innovation from one of their local service providers that if they could just extend the community counselor role from six months to 18 months as a young man or woman was coming out of the juvenile um, system, they could break that cycle and um, prevent them from ending up back in prison. And they took that, they advocated for that at the state level in alliance with other nonprofits, were able to get statewide funding so that every community had access to that. And they've been able to dramatically reduce recidivism and improve their approach to that really important social justice issue in the state of Connecticut. So the role of advocacy, I know you've talked about it this morning, I can't emphasize it enough. And, 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 and advocacy, by the way, you know, is, is way bigger than just going down to K Street and lobbying in Washington, D.C., right? It's raising awareness, it's filing lawsuits, it's um, joining in coalition and alliances um, to, to do this. So there's a lot of myths, and, and funders have a lot of myths around advocacy, too. Well, well, nonprofits, we can't do that. We can't fund that. Well, we know that nonprofits are fully able to advocate in this country. It's one of the freedoms we enjoy in a very open country. Um, now, there are limits to it. You can only spend a certain amount of your budget on it, but it's, um, it's not only allowable, it's, it's, um, I see it as our duty as part of our work in this sector. Okay, let's talk about another practice. We call it Inspire Evangelist, and this is all about how you work with individuals, individuals in your programs, people you serve, your volunteers. Probably no nonprofit exemplifies this better than Habitat for Humanity, right? Um, I mean, it's built into their business model. You know, when you build a Habitat house, you know, you've got volunteers, you're getting up on the roof, uh, putting nails into the tile, um, and you're doing it alongside with the person with the lived experience of poverty who might not have ever lived in her own house before with her family. And they're putting in the sweat equity next to the volunteers that are building the houses. And what happens as a result of that process is that you become inured to this cause. And it's what made you know, so many people go back to members of their church and people that they work with and say, you gotta do this and, and really spread this, this movement. Now, I will say that you know, there's a lot more efficient ways to build affordable housing, right, than with hundreds of hours of sweat equity from unskilled volunteer labor. But that's kind of the, not the point with Habitat. What they want to do is focus on the process and the journey so that more people become part of what they see as a movement to eradicate poverty housing from the face of the earth. They want to make it religiously, socially, and economically unacceptable, right? And that takes kind of one at a time. But we saw that each of the nonprofits that we studied also took the time to really work hand in hand with people with lived experience, um, not just treating them as clients to be served or statistics that need to be fixed, but it's much more involved, right? And they, they go through these four kind of concentric circles of activity. And it starts with they really articulate their values, what, what they're about. And then they create these meaningful experiences. So, you know, building a house or Teach for America has Teach Week where they get celebrities and politicians and local um, public safety officials to go in a classroom and teach for a couple hours and get a taste of what, what, what it's really like. Um, Heritage Foundation 
brings their conservative uh, supporters on roots of democra democracy tours. So they go to Greece and they go to where the underpinnings of all these values around freedom and individual freedom come from. And then that's what creates evangelists that go out and then tell other people about what you've done to get involved, be part of this movement. And then last but not least, great nonprofits spend a lot of time knitting together members of those communities so that you become a network in and of yourself. You're not just a means to an end, but you are part of this larger community. And it, it takes time, it takes money. Um, but they you know, talk about sometimes to go fast, sometimes you gotta go slow to go fast. If you wanna go far, if you wanna go quickly, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. And that's kind of having that long-term view in mind. Now the next practice I think builds on this and it's all about how you as nonprofits work with each other. Your nonprofit peers in your geographic community or in your field or issue area with the foundations that are also of course nonprofits. And the thing that we found about our nonprofits was they really looked at each other a little differently. They, they had what we call a network mindset. So think of a network, I've got a digital network picture up here. What makes a network so powerful, like a social media network like Facebook, it, yes, it's got nodes, I can put up my Facebook page, you can put up a page. The thing that makes it powerful is the links between the nodes and the infinite number of links. So how is the relationship different between high impact nonprofits versus your average performing nonprofit? Well, they, they adopt this network mindset. So, you know, high impact nonprofits, they don't see other nonprofits as just competitors for those grant contract, those grant dollars or government contracts or, you know, time on uh, the local news. They see you as potential collaborators to advance larger causes. And when, when a great, when a high impact nonprofit wants to have more impact, they don't just think, how do I grow my nonprofit? How do I go to a new city? Or how do I add programs? They think, how do I grow the network and get others? to adopt this idea. And then they do kind of counterintuitive things. They, they share resources. They open source their intellectual property. Um, they cultivate leadership for the whole field. So like Heritage Foundation has one of the most coveted internships down in DC where I live. Um, they wanna take their conservative acolytes and train them up. They, they have a dorm on Mass Ave. They house them, free housing. It's expensive to live in DC. Um, and, and, then they, and then they work for Heritage, but they send them over to Cato. They send them over to AEI, and they, they, they're, they're seeding the field, right? Um, and they don't hoard the talent. They, what, what these organizations do at the end of the day is they're thinking, how can we grow the pie so that we can all get a bigger slice rather than just trying to get the bigger slice for myself? Um, and it resonates a lot with some of the, you know, the abundance mentality I think that Rick talked about earlier this morning. So Exploratorium is a great example of this, you know, because when Exploratorium was just getting off the ground, you know, they were creating all this interactive exhibitry and, you know, there's physics involved as well as art and science and it's expensive to do this, it's hard to do it. They set aside 10% of their budget when they were just starting up just to train other museum curators to come out and see how it's done. Right? They'd publish cookbooks with recipes so that you could adopt it. Um, they spent time and resources really trying to proliferate the field. Um, and they didn't ask for you to call your museum. You know, the Museum of Science in Charlotte, for instance, is a great children's museum, trained up and, and mentored by them. But they don't call it right, the Exploratorium of Science. And, and so it, we do think about it in the nonprofit sector as kind of enlightened altruism, because you're giving it away and maybe you in the short term are losing something, but in the long term, you're changing, right, the entire field. Like, like, how much has the you know, museum field changed? I think about it in my own life. My um, son and I were, when he was younger, we were down on, uh, near the White House to see the tree lighting ceremony. Um, and before this all happened, um, we had a few minutes on the meter and I said, well, let's pop in this museum, the Corcoran Gallery of Art. This amazing gallery of modern art was right there. And, he was about four at the time, so, so we, we walked in there, and after about five minutes, he looked around at the installations, and he said, Mommy, let's get out of here. And I was like, why? You, you don't like the art? And he was like, well, you said we were going to a museum. This isn't a museum. This is just a picture store. 
what, where's nothing to do here, right? Like, like, like his idea of going to a museum was quite different than you know, what, what we in middle age might have as our mental models, right? And that's because of the way the Exploratorium tried to change the face of arts and culture. Um, the last practice from Forces for Good that I want to emphasize is share leadership. Latita mentioned this, and it's all about how you, if you're an executive director or a CEO, have, you know, we, we saw in our nonprofits, two at the top, sharing leadership uh, across a team, um, often co-founded by two people, um, and, and, and really not trying to hoard all of the power, right? And therefore sharing both responsibility with um, across their teams. And, you know, I, I recognize that we ask so much of our nonprofit leaders, you know, in so many cases, you are the chief cook and bottle washer and everything in between. Um, so our nonprofits really found a way, often you saw the executive director, or the CEO, kind of focusing external on those four other sectors of society. And you found an internal CEO or co-director who could, he or she could focus internally to make sure the programs and services were delivered with very high quality. Um, we saw different leadership attributes of these CEOs. Um, some of the lessons that we saw was that great leaders really um, put the organization ahead of their own need, right? It's all about the mission. And oftentimes they're putting the cause even ahead of the organization, right? Relentlessly pursuing these larger causes. I think about City Year when it was starting the Youth Corps. Um, they were the model for AmeriCorps and they spent much of their time trying to create what we now know as the Corporation for National and Community Service, creating millions of volunteer opportunities for young people age 18 to 25. Even if you don't do a city year core, because there's only 25, but you can do Habitat, Teach for America, Vista, it's all part of it. And to do that, you've really got to be able to let go of the ego, right? You've got to be able to lose um, that need to control, that need to be the center of attention so that you can advance these larger causes. And um, it's a very unique quality. It's, it's, it's very hard. And this ability to let go becomes even more important when you start to think about how you lead across movements and larger issues where you have no span of control, right? You're not, you can't hire and fire the people in your coalition or alliance if, if it's not working out. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about now at the movement level how these practices play out. So I'll give you an, let's, let's dive into the new book that just came out, which is about how change happens. And the, the driving question behind this book was, what makes some movements succeed? Why are some movements successful and some other not? And for this book, we looked at, again, not single organizations, but the big changes that have happened as a result of movements, right? So we looked at um, tobacco control, well, how, how smoking rates have dropped so low in this country. Um, we looked at movements that have peaked in the 21st century, so in our lifetimes, since 1990. We looked at LGBT marriage equality and the movement that led to that dramatic social justice reform. We also looked at, during the same time frame since 1990, at the massive expansion of gun rights, right? The, the gun policy landscape has really shifted to loosen gun laws, to make gun ownership and access much more uh, open in our country. That whole change has happened since the 1990s. Um, and then we also asked ourselves, why are other movements seem stuck? Why is gun control or gun violence prevention seem stymied against the National Rifle Association? And so we studied all sides and we came up with some lessons drawing on the insights from Forces for Good. Let, and let's just talk about one of the issues. For example, you know, when you look at the tobacco control movement, just take a moment to go back in time. It was just a few decades ago that smoking in the U.S. was a very different phenomenon, right? It was frequent. It was fashionable. Uh, in this room, half the men could have been holding a cigarette and would have been because it would have been banned, right, and, and work in public places. Doctors smoked. Um, I admit I smoked as a teenager um, in the 80s. My dad is here. I don't know if he knew that. Um, <laughs> Actually, there's a lot of things I regret from the 80s. Um, <laughs> perms, gauchos, ladies, let's talk later. Um, so 
in just a few decades, right, everything's switched. Smoking rates are, is banned in public places. Uh, rates are down nationally to 15% for adults, under 6% for youth. Gen Z could be the generation that ends smoking cigarettes, at least for good, right? We're going to leave vaping aside for a second. Um, so, you know, this has been a phenomenal uh, paradigm shift. And I, I understand that there's social disparities of health and there's certain communities where smoking is more prevalent, but nationally and all trends are down, right? When you look at the movement and the activism and the advocacy of networked nonprofits working together um, to make that happen, I will say that this change did not happen by chance, right? Smoking didn't just go out of fashion as healthy lifestyles came in, not with the powerful tobacco industry and the marketing prowess and the lobbying heft that they had trying to keep us continuing to purchase and use these products, right? Well, how'd they do it? The first lesson is the nonprofits built up grassroots armies, right? So you had the campaign for tobacco-free kids seated in 1995 with a grant from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Bill Novelli, my colleague who founded the center I'm with at Georgetown, was the founding president of um, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids. He's still on the board, Matt Myers is the CEO. They were created as a C3 to be the voice of the non-smokers rights and anti-tobacco community. But they weren't just one nonprofit, right? They were a coalition working with American Heart, American Cancer, American Lung, Truth Initiative, joining up with Americans for Non-Smokers Rights, the non-smokers rights movements, working across coalitions with these big health voluntaries that have millions of members and they became the boots on the ground. So then when it came time to advocate and change policies, like to take one example, uh, what, one way we knew to lower smoking rates worked is to make cigarettes too expensive, right? Put a tax on a cigarette. CDC had evidence showing that it would reduce youth smoking by a really marked percent. Now, of course, conservatives don't like it. It's a blunt tool, but, but it works. So, so they said, let's pass excise taxes so we can tax cigarettes and reduce smoking that way. Well, you'd never be able to pass those very controversial taxes unless you had all of these boots on the ground. And how did they do it? Well, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, yes, they funded the national group, but RWJF put three quarters of a billion dollars into tobacco control over 10 years. And this is one thing where a foundation got it right. The biggest chunk of money, a quarter of a billion dollars, went to you guys, 40 state and local-based coalitions, some scrappy, some more you know, uh, skilled than others, that took these armies and then advocated, you built the social and political will on the ground to pass these laws to be part of this movement, right? So these movements are big, they're interconnected, it's complex, but it starts from investing in the grassroots and building from the grassroots up. Another thing these very successful movements do that, that really kind of surprised us was they were very intentional about changing norms, changing our hearts and minds, right? You can't just change the rules of the game. You gotta change the way people feel about it, right? Like with smoking, it was much about passing taxes as trying to make smoking uncool. How do you make this unsexy, right? So I'm gonna show you this uh, ad, a uh, social media campaign from Truth Initiative which gives you a flavor of why the tobacco control advocates have been so successful. What's great about that ad? Everything, right. It's, it's funny, it's, um, it's funny, right? And here's some things that they got right with this ad, right? It, for, this went viral in a nanosecond, you know, um, tons of teens. I found out about this ad because my then 10-year-old uh, child was um, asking about the book I was writing and I was saying it's about things like smoking. A lot of people used to smoke, not as many people smoke today. And he said, oh yeah, no, I would, 
we, we wouldn't smoke, it could kill cats. And I said, what? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, it's like that cat video on YouTube. And I'm like, so we had to look it up and, and, um, and, and you, it's addictive, right? Then we had to watch it a couple more times and we searched other stupid pet videos. Um, but it worked, like my children will, you know, will never pick it up. But the reason why it works is three things. It's got the right message, right? It doesn't say smoking this is gonna kill you, right? What's the best way to get a young boy to try something? Tell him it's dangerous. <laughs> Tell him it's bad for him, right? I've experienced this. So, so it, it, it's bad for your pet. What do, what do young people, Gen Z, care a lot about? Social justice, animal rights. Like, get them, get them where it's something they care about, right? And then it's got the right messenger. Who's the narrator of this video? Not me, not a mom, not a doctor in a lab coat, right? It's something they'll listen to. And then, of course, it's in the right medium, right? It's on YouTube, it's viral, it's a video. So they got all these things right. If you really want to get your message across and change people's behavior, in this case, don't ever pick up a cigarette or tell your peers this is not cool, um, you got to be in the right medium with the right message and have the right messenger. So, so really effective movements figure out how to do that. And by the way, this is expensive. It takes a lot of research. It looks inexpensive and homemade, but there's, uh, as you well know, the creative behind it and the research into the psycho psychographics of the generation to inform all is really baked in there. Now, another reason why tobacco control has been um, successful is they worked with and through the business sector, companies, you know, the airline industry actually was the first entity to ban smoking, right? Because flight crews realized they were getting sick and dying on these flights. So airlines and then restaurants came on board later, now casinos. Um, and we found these kind of um, four different ways that companies, you can leverage companies for your, for your cause, right? So one is by getting them to be first policy movers, right? Ban smoking. I remember when CVS Health stopped selling cigarettes in 2014. That was a really big deal. And these are, these are major decisions because they lost $2 billion in revenue from cigarette sales to chew and everything else. But they made it back because they rolled out their minute clinics and, and, and other things. Um, they went in their different direction. But you, when a company changes its policies, you're seeing a lot today around the gun debate, right? Putting pressure on Walmart or Dick's Sporting Goods to stop selling assault weapons, stop selling to, they, they voluntarily raised the age to buy guns to 21. So the, the, the companies are becoming playing fields um, where these causes and movements are butting heads. Um, Clearly, companies can be advocates, educators, underwrite campaigns in, in the traditional sense. Sometimes there's a product innovation coming out of the commercial sector, right? Nicorette gum helps you quit smoking, or uh, interlock safety ignition devices helps reduce drunk driving. And then last but not least, companies in this day and age, in the digital era, are really hyper-exposed to your activism, both nonprofits, consumers, because of course, with the democratization of technology and individual um, can, can have a very big voice instantaneously. So how do they do it? These movements are successful because in the end they have leaderful leadership, this shared leadership concept spread across a movement. Now, to explain what I mean, uh, you know, on one end of the spectrum, leaders can be kind of, movements might be leaderless. They're chaotic. They're anarchy, right? Remember, remember uh, Occupy Wall Street? Lots of protests. Lots of you know, kerfuffle, but it kind of died out. They didn't really have um, a, an organized approach. On the other hand, movements can be too top-down, too leader-led, the, the big groups out of DC dictating down. The effective movements find this balance in the middle and they're leader-full. So what do we, we mean by that? If you look at tobacco control, you know, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids was the 501c3 at the center of this, but they, really saw their role as orchestrating all these other nonprofits and getting everybody to play in harmony, right? They're kind of like a conductor of an orchestra. You're not all playing the same melody, right? You're doing your thing, but you're moving in the same direction, playing in harmony. And that's what leaderful movement leaders are able to do, whether it's for smoking cessation or LGBT marriage. And we've seen it very effective on the, the gun rights side too. So if you get a chance to look at how change happened, there's more stories and data there. So we've talked about change on all these levels. Um, and
understand concepts for really designed to help you think about how you can change the world, have more impact. Um, and as we close, I just want to leave you with these kind of three thoughts um, from all of my research and thinking on these issues over the last really almost 20 years. Um, and the first thing I come away with is, uh, first of all, you know, change is possible. It's, it, it can be hard. I know you can get down at some points, particularly when resources are thin or if, you know, um, people in power don't necessarily agree with um, your approach. Um, but when you think about the changes that have happened in the last 20 years, you know, it used to be, you know, no, pretty much nobody smokes. There used to be cigarettes everywhere. Now there's now, now guns are everywhere in this country, openly carried in all but a handful of states. We celebrate gay weddings. No one lets a friend drive drunk, right? Like, like all these changes have happened in the same exact time period with the exact same people in office inside the Beltway, right? Which, um, another point is that change is collective, right? Not, no single nonprofit alone is going to drive any of the big outcomes that we want, right? It's working in coalitions with each other, working across sectors, nonprofit, public, and private. My last point is this. Um, I, I've come to really believe that change is deliberate. Very few changes happen by chance. You know, we didn't all just wake up on one day and say, I'm going to quit smoking today, right? We didn't decide to just allow gay marriage. You have to look at the campaigns and the advocacy and the, the litigation and everything that went behind it. Whereas to the lay person, it might just be, well, we all watched Will and Grace, right? It might be part of it, but it doesn't really explain it, you know, um, with the opposition. Um, when you really dig into anything that's meaningful, you're going to find nonprofit leaders like you, advocates, individual citizens who've come together to deliberately choose to drive forth the changes that have happened in the world. I hope these practices will help you when you go back to your organizations tomorrow, become stronger forces for good, and help you be the change that you seek to be in the world. Thank you very much. We are incredibly grateful uh, to have Leslie here today. And so we thank you very much for your very much empowering words. Um, and I, I, I don't know about you, I feel very galvanized and ready to start uh, implementing what she has uh, taught us today. Um, there is once again the opportunity to be able to ask questions to Leslie. Uh, if you go into the community section of your app and you uh, will find towards the top uh, questions for Leslie. So please feel free to post in there any questions that you may have. We'll be able to take a few questions before uh, we move on to our breakout sessions. Uh, Leslie's also available to sign your book if you so wish, um, but let's not overwhelm her too much because <laughs> we're very grateful to have her here. So let's see if any questions have come through. Not yet, but I'm quite sure that everybody has questions for Leslie. I know. I know some things have come up to me, and, um, but I want to get your questions first. Well, wh while they're Please. filing in the questions or trying to figure out how this thing works, <laughs> um, Latita asked a really good question over lunch while we were getting ready for this, which was, you know, often you don't know a movement's been successful until the change has occurred, right? And ha but did you know it was a movement before? And, and I thought that was a really interesting question because you know, we studied changes, um, but a lot of times the movements or campaigns are kind of invisible behind it. You know, when you look at you know, marriage equality, that Supreme Court ruling for most people kind of came out of the blue, unless you were really involved with that particular campaign. But underneath it, you had Freedom to Marry, a 501c3 that was working with GLAAD and Lambda Legal and HRC and state-based um, gay pride coalitions to orchestrate law changes, litigation strategies, norm change campaigns at the local level, but they're kind of invisible you know, at the higher level. Um, and then you think about emerging movements today, like Me Too, right? It's, it's very visible, um, and, uh, or Black Lives Matter is, is, is another one where they have a very committed um, 
focus on trying to be leaderless, right? They're not, they don't want any one person in charge. And so, um, but sometimes it's a movement, sometimes it's a campaign, sometimes it presents as a protest, sometimes it presents as behind the scenes and advocacy. And, um, you know, and, I, and you don't know if it's gonna be successful, of course, until you see the change manifest out in the world. So, yeah, but that was a great question. That it is. Uh, Brian Ebersol, of course, was the <laughs> first one in with the question. <laughs> Again. <laughs> um, he asked, can you talk a little bit more about transcendent listening and how it can lead to change? Transcendent listening, yes. Um, so that's a quote that um, came out of an interview with Fred Krupp, the president of Environmental Defense Fund, who uh, we interviewed for the book on movements. We were looking at one of the two movements we were looking at was in the environmental realm. You know, how is it that we solved acid rain in North America, which was a big problem here in Pennsylvania and across much of the um, uh, North and Midwest? We solved acid rain, but now we're, we're stuck on carbon cuts, right? Um, and, and why was that, um, what, you know, what, what, what could explain that? And, and he, as Environmental Defense Fund, is a green group, but they are very um, involved with using market forces, business, to solve environmental problems. So how do you get business behind solutions? So they're not like the radical Greenpeace commandeering, you know, whaling ships and trying to put themselves in the face of danger. They're really trying to work with and through business. And he taught, you know, it, it comes from a quote from John Dunn, a, the a Jesuit theologian who talks about crossing over. So if you have a faith, let's say you have a Jesuit or Catholic faith, but if you spend time studying and learning about the Judaic faith, right, you cross over and you walk in those moccasins, you know, people say, well, that's risky. Maybe you'll convert. But often when you cross over and look at the world through another person's faith lens, instead of converting you to the other side, it crystallizes your own beliefs. It help, gives you clarity into why you believe what you believe in the first place. So, and, and, and when you're in the nonprofit world, by trying to understand, for instance, how does business view this, right? Business needs to make a profit to stay in business. So how do we find profit motive and incentivize them to do what we think is the right thing on the behalf of the environment? Um, so you know, that's how they came up, for instance, with the policy intervention called cap and trade, which was the solution to acid rain. It said, well, let companies have a market for um, sulfur uh, uh, emissions, but we'll let them trade them and put a cap. And so instead of government regulating business and telling them you have to and we're gonna you know, punish you if you don't meet these reductions, business regulated itself and the sulfur rates went down much quicker and much more cheaply than if government had come in. So they used a market you know, approach to get business to compete to see who could be the best on this environmental issue. And it worked. So, um, so it, it, I think it, if you pull back, it really speaks to really trying to understand people who are coming at it very differently from you, right? Um, um, and if it's the corporate sector, you know, you know, a lot of nonprofits just look at a company as maybe the foundation writing a check, but what does the company want to accomplish and how can we partner with you to advance our, our cause, and you might get some very different answers to the question rather than how much grant can you give me? So I think that's a little bit about that. Excellent. Uh, Laura Duchesi asks, for organizations that want to start working towards becoming networked and leaderless, uh, what, if, uh, what advice can you give as they embark on that process? So to become networked and, and be more leaderful, um, we, I mean, I would say one is, you know, join with local alliances and, and coalitions, right? And um, you don't necessarily have to start it, but if, even if you allocate, you know, a, a, a day, a month of one of your staff members to be part of uh, an alliance or a coalition or join together and try and find a funder who can co-fund an advocate who can represent your particular cause, right? Then, then you're not bearing all the risk or the weight on yourself. Um, a, a really interesting nonprofit in Connecticut executive director who works with young people coming out of incarceration, um, his staff and his performance reviews, he changed it. And so he has his regular performance review metrics. And he said each staff member gets 10% of their evaluation based on um, the quantity or quality of policy change ideas they come up with. So he's trying to incentivize 
staff to um, think about how they can play in the larger sandbox, um, even if you're not going wholly into advocacy. So the, the next two questions I'm gonna to merge together for interest of time and also their, their similarity and, and thoughts. So Sarah and Loretta um, have said, how do you lean in to embrace your change movement when you meet resistance and what would you recommend that managerial personnel do to let go of their egos? <laughs> That's a hard one. Um, yeah, um, it to a room full of managers. <laughs> I mean, I do think that in these coalitions, it letting go it means really trying to focus on the north star. What is the change that you seek in the world, right? So, there's this story coming out of the LGBT marriage uh, movement that. Um, it's, it's kind of funny, in the book, they were going to New York to try and pass a law to allow same-sex marriage. And um, there's this pivotal moment where some of the leaders of the key advocacy groups sit down with Governor Cuomo at the time, and he's about to be inaugurated. And he says, you know, I want to be the governor that signs this bill into law. And he says, but first, uh, basically, you buffoons need to get your act together and work together, right? And he used some expletives, which I'm not going to repeat here. But you know, you're fighting among yourselves, you're competing for dollars, and it's all about your campaign or your campaign. And I'm not going to put you know, some heavy statewide political chits behind this until you get a line. So what did they do? They, um, Freedom to Marry and HRC and Empire um, State Gay Pride Agenda, they got together and they created a campaign called New Yorkers United for Marriage. So it wasn't the HRC campaign, right? It wasn't the Freedom to Marry. They didn't brand it their own. It was kind of like a no label. And they said, we're going to share our donor lists, and we're going to um, merge it all up, and we're each going to put in X percent of our you know, um, communications budget into this campaign. And, and then they also did something very tactical that was effective. They signed an MOU that said, after this campaign, win or lose, whatever happens, here's what happens to any leftover money. Here's how the donor list get split back up. So they, they negotiated all of those things that a lot of us get stuck on, basically money and uh, networks. And, and, and then, then they were able to work together to lobby for the common cause. And what happens is they each kind of lost their own organization's brand in that. But at the end of the day, they won, right? And then they could all gain credit, credit for the success. Um, and as we know, the orphan, uh, a failure is an orphan, but a success has many founding mothers and fathers. So, um, <laughs> um, so, so I think being really um, transparent about what it is you're going to argue over or compete over, and then negotiate that in advance. And then you got to be re willing to subsume yourself to the coalition, but keep in mind if you win, whether it's you know healthcare for all or LGBT marriage or um, you know. Um, uh, the environmental cause, you know, keep your North Star focused on the impact that you want to achieve. And um, hopefully you'll get there. Excellent. Uh, let us please give another large and, and grateful thank you to Leslie for her insight. Um, if you don't get the opportunity to, to talk directly with Leslie, I encourage you to use the app to rate uh, all of our sessions and provide your feedback uh, to us that way, um, which we'll happily share with Leslie and all of our session participants. Um, if you're in the session, you can hit the, the button with the stars on it, and please let us know um, how much you loved, um, how much you loved Leslie. So. Um, so I thank you all for your attention during today's plenary lunch. I hope you enjoy your afternoon sessions. Um, if you have any questions, please visit us at the registration desk. Otherwise, the next sessions are going to start in about 5-10 minutes. Thanks, everybody.